We've looked at some of the physical properties of organic molecules, but our greater interest lies in their chemical reactions. We can use Lewis structures, not just as a guide to molecular structure, but also molecular reactivity. We just need to learn how to read the information that the Lewis structure is telling us. And what it's telling us is where the electrons are. How do we use Lewis structures to identify the reactive sites in a molecule? How do we predict chemical behavior or the products of a reaction? We do this by looking for electron-rich and electron-poor regions in molecules, which allows us to classify them as nucleophiles and electrophiles. Most reactivity in organic chemistry comes down to one simple idea. The electrons go from where they are to where they're not. Electron-rich atoms will tend to connect with electron-poor atoms and form a new chemical bond in the process. We can trace the reactivity of the electron pairs in organic molecules using a symbolism that you're already familiar with in the context of resonance forms. Curved arrows. Grab your pen. When drawing resonance forms, we use curved arrows to represent the apparent movement of electron pairs within a molecule to show how the arrangement of electrons differ among the various resonance structures. Now we're going to follow the same rules, but some of the arrows will move from one molecule to another, indicating a chemical reaction. A curved arrow starts on either a bond or a lone pair in the reactants, and then it shows you where those electrons appear in the products by directing that pair to a new atom, either in the same molecule or a different one. Most reactions involve an arrow that directs a lone pair on one molecule to an atom on the other so that that lone pair becomes a new bond connecting the atoms together. Consider ammonia acting as a weak base in water to form the ammonium cation and the hydroxide anion. Acid-base reactivity can be thought of as a transfer of a proton from the acid to the base, but we can also think of it in terms of arrows representing the changing position of the electrons. To transfer a proton from water to ammonia, we need to form a new bond from nitrogen to that hydrogen. An arrow starts on the nitrogen lone pair and directs it toward the hydrogen atom in water. That lone pair in the reactant becomes a new nitrogen-hydrogen bond in the product. But to complete the transfer, we also need to break the OH bond in water. So we need a second arrow, which starts at that bond and ends on the neighboring oxygen atom. That electron pair now becomes a third lone pair on the O in the products. All acid-base reactions involve the formation of a new bond and breaking an old one. The first arrow starts at a lone pair in the base and is directed toward the hydrogen atom, forming the new bond. Then, a second arrow breaks a bond in the acid. See if you can correctly represent the curved arrows for this acid-base reaction. It's probably a good idea for you to draw these structures out yourself. Where should a curved arrow start and finish to represent the reaction between formic acid and dimethylamine? Start at an OH bond pair and finish at the N. Start at an O lone pair and finish at the H in dimethylamine. Start at a hydrogen atom in formic acid and finish at nitrogen. Start at the nitrogen lone pair and finish at a hydrogen in formic acid. No, the oxygen-hydrogen bond does need to break, but that arrow won't correctly depict the role of the nitrogen lone pair. In an acid-base reaction, the first arrow always starts at a lone pair on the base and directs it toward the acid-hydrogen atom. No, in an acid-base reaction, the first arrow always directs a pair of electrons in the base to the hydrogen atom in the acid. Which molecule is the base? No, curved arrows represent the movement of electron pairs, not atoms. You're not showing where the hydrogen atom goes. Electron pairs involved in making and breaking the chemical bonds are what the curved arrows are supposed to represent. That's right. In an acid-base reaction, the first arrow always starts on an electron pair in the base and directs it toward the hydrogen atom in the acid. In this case, that means starting on the nitrogen lone pair and directing it toward the H to form a new NH bond in the product. A second arrow then needs to take the OH bond pair in one of the reactants and move it onto the oxygen atom, where it becomes a new lone pair. If you're used to thinking of chemical reactions as moving atoms around, this will take some getting used to. 
The curved arrows aren't about the atoms. Instead, they focus our attention on the electrons involved in making and breaking the chemical bonds. This shift in focus from the atoms to the electrons gives us a new understanding of acid-base reactions, one that now is based on the lone pairs in the Lewis structures. We can redefine what acids and bases are in terms of the electron pairs. A Lewis base is a molecule that shares an electron pair with a Lewis acid. A Lewis acid is a molecule that accepts an electron pair from the Lewis base. The newly shared electron pair forms a new bond between an atom in the base and an atom in the acid. These definitions correspond to the Bronsted definitions that you're already used to. The base is still the base, but now it's not the base because it accepts a proton. It's a base because it donates an electron pair. This new way to think about reactivity isn't limited to Bronsted acids and bases. We can extend it to other reactions as well. But in organic chemistry, we usually use other words to describe them. Words that will focus our attention on the roles of the electrons. The Lewis base is also called a nucleophile, which means nucleus loving, because it's looking for a positively charged atom to share its electrons with. The Lewis acid can be called an electrophile, electron loving, because it's looking for a molecule that will share a pair of electrons. In a reaction between a nucleophile and an electrophile, the first arrow starts at the delta negative electron pair on the nucleophile and directs it toward a delta positive atom in the electrophile. In the product, that electron pair on the nucleophile becomes a new bond between these two atoms. So let's see if we can apply these definitions. This will also give you some practice drawing these structures and arrows for yourself. In a reaction between cyanide and 1-bromopropane, which molecule is in the nucleophile and which atom is the specific delta positive electrophilic reaction site? Cyanide and the carbon atom. Cyanide and the nitrogen atom. Bromopropane, the carbon atom next to the bromine. Bromopropane, the bromine atom. No, the electrophile is the electron pair acceptor, not the electron pair donor. Which atom in which molecule is accepting the electron pair? Not quite. Look carefully at the first arrow, which directs the lone pair from the nucleophile to the electrophilic atom in the electrophile. Which specific atom is it pointing to? That's right, the bromopropane is the electrophile, accepting an electron pair from the nucleophilic cyanide. The delta positive reaction center is the carbon atom next to the electronegative bromine. Now that we've classified the reactants, let's see if we can identify the products. Again, practice drawing these structures for yourself. Grab your pen. Let's draw those two reactants again. Cyanide and one bromopropane. Now we decided that the cyanide was the nucleophile, so we'll draw an arrow from the cyanide carbon lone pair to the bromopropane electrophilic carbon. That's this one, next to the delta negative bromine. We also need the second arrow from the carbon bromine bond to the bromine atom. Usually the electrophilic center has to break a bond in these reactions because it's about to gain another one from the nucleophile. In this case, this carbon starts with four bonds, so if it forms a new one from the cyanide, it needs to break the old one to the bromine. Pause the video for a moment and see if you can correctly draw the structures of the products given these curved arrows. Count the carbons carefully and be sure to include all the necessary formal charges. When you have your drawings, push play again and I'll show you the answer. The first arrow from the cyanide carbon atom lone pair to the bromopropane delta positive carbon means a new bond forms between the cyanide and bromopropane carbon atoms. That lone pair turns into this bond, here. The second arrow shows the carbon-bromine bond pair moving onto the bromine atom. That bond is lost, and those electrons now become a lone pair on the bromine instead. The nucleophilic carbon in cyanide had a negative formal charge, but in the product it's charged zero because now it has four bonds. The bromine atom in the electrophile becomes anionic bromide. Eight electrons give it the negative formal charge. So how did you do? Until you get used to the lines and arrows, it can sometimes be difficult to see exactly where all the atoms are. If you need to, redraw the molecule and make all the atoms more explicit. You can draw in this delta positive carbon atom and its two hydrogens so that it's easier to see what's going on. Make a new bond of the carbon with the first arrow and break another with the second. Let's try another example. This time, after identifying the nucleophile and the electrophile, we'll try drawing the arrows given the products instead of the other way around. In a reaction between methoxide and nitrosonium, 
which molecule is the nucleophile, and which atom is the delta positive center in the electrophile. Nitrosonium, the oxygen on methoxide. Nitrosonium, carbon on the methoxide. Methoxide, oxygen on nitrosonium. Methoxide, nitrogen on nitrosonium. No, the nucleophile is an electron pair donor. It shares an electron pair with the electrophile. With its positive charge, the nitrosonium is going to have the most electrophilic atom in these two reactants. Look again at the reactant molecules. Which atom is the most electron rich? Remember, the reactive atom in the electrophile must be delta positive. Which atom in which molecule has a positive charge? That's right. The negative charge on the oxygen in methoxide makes it very electron rich. So that lone pair is going to be the nucleophile. The positive charge in nitrosonium makes it electrophilic. Grab your pen again. Let's draw those arrows. Here are methoxide and nitrosonium again. They react to form methyl nitrate, which looks like this. Now where should the arrows be drawn to indicate the rearrangement of electrons in this reaction? Remember your answers to the last question and look carefully at this product structure. Hit pause on the video and try drawing your arrows. When you're ready, hit play again and I'll show you the answer. The first arrow should be simple. Electrons go from where they are to where they're not. In this case, that means starting on a lone pair on the negative oxygen atom in the methoxide nucleophile and ending at the positive charge on the nitrogen in the nitrosonium electrophile. So now there's this new NO bond. The methoxide oxygen lone pair has been dragged by the arrow and turned into this bond pair. But we need a second arrow. If we just stopped there, there would be five bonds and 10 electrons at this nitrogen, a violation of the octet rule. Nitrogen can break one of its bonds to an O atom. The reaction both makes and breaks a bond at the electrophilic atom. In this case, we move one pair of electrons in one of the bond pairs of this NO double bond and direct it out toward the oxygen. That turns a bond pair into an extra lone pair and creates a negative formal charge on that O. So how did you do? One last reaction, but I'm not going to show you the products this time. For a reaction between chloride and sulfur trioxide, where should the first arrow start and finish? Start on the sulfur, finish on the chlorine. Start on an oxygen and finish on the chlorine. Start on the chlorine and finish on the sulfur. Start on the chlorine and finish on an oxygen. No. The first arrow has to start on a lone pair on a delta negative atom in the nucleophile. Sulfur has no lone pair and it isn't delta negative. No, the arrow has to start on a delta negative atom in the nucleophile and the oxygen atoms do meet that criteria, but the arrow has to finish on a delta positive atom in the electrophile. The chlorine has a negative charge. It can't be the electrophile. Almost. The arrow has to start on a delta minus atom in the nucleophile, something electron rich. So that's the chloride. But that arrow has to finish on a delta positive atom in the electrophile. Which atom in sulfur trioxide is delta positive? That's right. The arrow has to start on a lone pair in the electron rich nucleophile. So that's the chloride. And it has to finish on a delta positive atom in the electrophile. That's the sulfur. Now let's see if you can draw the arrows and the product. Here's the chloride and sulfur trioxide with the delta positive sulfur atom. So where should the curved arrows be drawn? And given those arrows, what's the structure of the expected product in this reaction? Hit pause and draw your response. When you're ready, hit play again and I'll show you the answer. Now we decided on the previous question that the first arrow needs to start at a chloride lone pair because it's the nucleophile and it has to direct that lone pair to the delta positive sulfur in SO3, like this. But if we just stopped there and didn't move any other electrons, we'd get this structure. The chloride lone pair becomes a new chlorine-sulfur bond, and then nothing else changes. That puts seven bonds around the sulfur atom and a negative formal charge on what is actually the least electronegative atom in the compound. We can probably do better than that. Usually we expect both to make a new bond and to break an old one at the electrophilic atom in the electrophile. So let's do that. We can draw a second arrow from one of the sulfur-oxygen bond pairs out onto its oxygen atom, which will put a new lone pair there. Now the negative formal charge is on an oxygen. That's the most electronegative atom, so that's probably a better representation. Obviously, there are other resonance forms that we could draw as well, but this is the correct product. 
It's called chlorosulfate. So. Today we learned about a new way to think about acid-base reactions, not in terms of the proton being transferred, but in terms of the electrons being shared. Then we extended that idea to other reactions and defined the terms nucleophile and electrophile. Finally, we got some practice using curved arrows to represent the rearrangement of electrons in reactions between nucleophiles and electrophiles so that they can show us which bonds are formed and which bonds are broken. Now this is just a starting point. There are some other things to think about when you're trying to identify a good nucleophile or trying to decide which bond might break in an electrophile. You'll get the chance to explore those factors and get a lot more practice drawing curved arrows for these types of reactions in your next class.